Okay, so you're here for this talk, How I Learned to Time Travel, or Data Pipelining and Scheduling with Airflow. My name is Laura Lorenz. Here are some places you can contact me via the internet. Um, and I'm here actually right now representing Industry Dive, work that I do at my um, job there. Uh, we're hiring. You can see the little bubble here. So um, if you want to check us out, we're a business uh, media publishing company. Um, it's pretty cool, I would say. And if you like any of the stuff that I'm talking about right now, definitely come talk to me if you are in the job market. So first thing I want to just put out some truths that I think we can all get behind. One, data is weird and breaks stuff. And user data is particularly untrustworthy, just don't trust it. So we deal our whole ETL process that we've been developing at um, Industry Dive has been a lot related to um, user data that they submit. Um, so we've had a, a lot of exciting times with that. And the other one is that computers slash internet slash third party services slash everything will fail and blow up all of the scripts that you wrote to do whatever your genius ETL stuff was. And that's really frustrating. And so um, based on both of these uh, true facts and also while I was looking at uh, some past Pi data talks uh, to get an idea of you know what people were talking about these types of things, I saw this quote, which I totally just wanted to steal and put in my proposal in the first place, but instead I'm attributing it here, but I still wanted to bring it up. So I'm um, at Pi Data London 2016 this year. Uh, there was this quote, in the beginning, there was cron. We had one job, it ran at 1 a.m. and it was good, <laughs> right? And so Pete said it a little differently later, but basically, um, what happened for us, as well as him, is that it wasn't just one job anymore. It was like 100 jobs. And it didn't run at 1 AM anymore. It's like, depends. And maybe if this other stuff ran successfully, then I want to run this other thing. And it was no longer good. And so we no longer were using cron. Instead, it was just chaos, right? So this was kind of the situation that we found ourselves in. Um, so the basic issue here for us is that plumbing problems suck. This is true in real life, and this is also true for your data pipeline. So we knew that we had to figure something else out. So we already had some thoughts about how we wanted this to go, just based on like our early proof of concepts. Um, we would prefer something in open source Python so we know what's going on and could easily extend it, because we're a Python shop at Industry Dive. Uh, we wanted something resilient. This is a lot about what I just sort of motivated this talk about. We wanted to handle failure well, any types of failure. Um, so we wanted there to be retry logic, uh, able to specify failure callbacks, good alerting and monitoring. All of this was going to make our life a lot easier to figure out what's going on. We wanted it to be able to deal with complexity intelligently. So we were growing and growing what we wanted to do. We needed more complicated uh, dependency parsing. Um, and we also wanted it to only have to run what it had to. We didn't want to have to do extra work if uh, we had already done some part of the pipeline. And we wanted a lot of flexibility. We wanted to be able to run anything that we wanted. And we already knew that we had batch tasks that we were planning on running on a daily and hourly schedule. So we were already just in the, in the market for a batch processing system that could help us deal with this. So we traveled the land and uh, came up with this chart that I've made to sort of squish down a lot of different uh, tools that we took a look at. Um, and I kind of separate them into two different classes. We have these light, uh, lighter color ones, Make, Drake, Pi Do It, Luigi, uh, which I sort of discerned were more on the file-based dependency system. So they um, look for certain files to change or um, compare metadata between files, and then they uh, do some sort of work that then outputs to a file. So all of the dependency is based on which files where have been made and when. Whereas these on the other side, in the darker gray, Airflow, AWS Data Pipeline, and Pinball, we found that those were more abstract about their dependency generation. It wasn't uh, tracked directly to files necessarily. Um, and uh, you would configure that in code. They all have their own sort of way to represent that. Um, as we go across this uh, picture, there's other sorts of um, features that also become really great besides these two sort of class distinctions that um, also kind of vary. So we can start out where it's just a dependency framework, but as we go further to the other side, we'll see that they'll ship with more scheduling, more monitoring, more alerting in the box. Uh, to sort of that point, these ones on, I guess this is your left, um, are more lightweight. They won't specify any sort of like protocols you would normally use. There's not a lot of reusable components for normal or I guess standard ETL type of things. Um, but if you go to the other side, everything's a little more heavyweight. There's more infrastructure for it, but there's a lot more batteries included. 
And then there's also this x, uh, this y-axis dimension um, about docs and community, which was also really important to us because we were interested in being able to extend and customize. And um, you can see sort of my take on how all of these different things uh, delivered on that uh, term as well. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about this file dependencies target system concept. So the concept for these this class of pipelining uh, tool is that there's some files or file or files that are some dependency that have to exist before some sort of recipe or action has to occur. And that recipe or action will consume those files somehow, do something, and then output to some sort of target. And then the system will be able to tell if this target exists, we don't need to redo that this recipe anymore. Or if these files have changed, like their metadata, their timestamp is different from this target, we know that there's updated information here that we need to filter into a new target. So um, make is like a classic example of this. Um, and you can see here uh, some of the syntax. Um, I'm not going to go into too many details, but that you can see the track back to the file dependencies concept, what the target actually is, and what work we're actually going to do. Uh, Drake is sort of an extension to make. Their tagline is like, make for data, actually, is what they call themselves. So this has a similar concept. It started to introduce um, more variable substitution, built-in variable substitution, and also different types of protocols. Uh, you didn't just have to run bash scripts. You could give it other stuff that you wanted to do. Um, and that's also growing for them as well. Uh, PyDoIt is more of a Python version. Um, you define all of your configuration and your tasks in Python code, and then this is the same sort of track back. You have a concept of targets, a concept of your file dependencies, and a concept of different actions that you want to take on those. And then Luigi is another one that is sort of the bridge between, I think, these two uh, systems that I'm talking about, but it still has this file dependency based design paradigm. So it will have a concept that a specific task has some sort of requires method that defines what files it depends on, some output method that defines where the target output is going to be written to, and then the actual logic. So while we were taking a look at these tools, we came up with different pros and cons. Pros, we really liked that this work was cached in these files for each of these different steps, especially we were coming at it from we had a lot of different transformations we wanted to be able to do. And we liked that if we got so far in the process and something came up later, it was easy for us to just start again from wherever we uh, left off. And the, you saw the syntax really briefly here, but it's pretty simple and intuitive configuration for data transformations especially. You have it inputs, you have a target, and you do some work, and th the syntax is really clear and simple. Cons for us was that there wasn't really a native concept of things happening on any sort of schedule. So um, Luigi started to introduce this, but um, this concept doesn't really exist outside of you building it yourself. And uh, Luigi doesn't have an actual polling process to figure out when it needs to do stuff, so that didn't come included. Um, the alerting systems for these felt a little too basic, too much like heavy lifting for us to rewrite them to include them. And the design paradigm was not broadly applicable to other non-target operations. So if you wanted to do something else that didn't necessarily do this type of, wasn't a data transformation, but you had other types of stuff that you wanted to live in the same ecosystem, this didn't really like naturally fall into that kind of um, work. So the other class, uh, the darker gray ones that I showed you on that first image, um, I have made up this term called abstract orchestration systems to define what they are. But um, they're less concerned with targets um, because these tasks don't necessarily have to have actual data transfer between them, but they do have some sort of logical dependency that one has to happen before the other one. And so you define these relationships between these tasks by um, in whatever the code configuration system is for these different platforms. And then uh, you end up with this graph that shows you your different types of work and what their edges connecting them are. Um, so for example, one we looked at was pinball. Um, so you can see it's getting like a little more fancy here. And the actual just work here is specified. Um, uh, this dependency and this work is really specified right here. Um, but all of these start to incorporate the concept of things happening on a schedule and also incorporate the concept of a schedule or process that's constantly checking to see if it's time to do something. Um, this is Airflow. We'll go into this a little bit more too, but this is what the configuration kind of looks for that, like for that. So you have uh, this Pythonic way to set these uh, relationships and the whole configuration ends up in Python. So when we were taking a look at all these abstract orchestration systems, uh, so we liked that a lot of these 
there's a lot of coincident features that also uh, are occurring. Like there's many more operations supported out of the box with these types of systems. They're just like a little more sophisticated and there's a lot more behind them. Um, they handle more complicated dependency logic, uh, all sorts of different types of trigger rules. Things can branch, things could um, depend on each other only sometimes. They could have all different types of schedules. And the scheduling process, the monitoring, and the alerting services that are already built in are pretty sophisticated. So you didn't need to have a separate scheduling service to figure out if it was time to do any work. But also there's just some monitoring, t monitoring tools or uh, especially email alerting is a really popular one that was already built in. Cons for us, uh, this caching concept, this file caching concept kind of went away. Um, so the idea uh, that individual data transformations could cache uh, their data in between was not something that was really a native concept anymore. The configuration is more complex. You saw the code examples a little bit. It's no longer just two lines to describe your targets, your file dependencies, and your outputs. Um, and there's more infrastructure. So now instead of the state of your workflow pipeline existing in files on disk, instead there needs to be some other persistent storage that knows what's going on. In all of these cases, they have some sort of database back that is keeping track of what has been worked on and what hasn't. And um, a lot of these also, um, especially Airflow I'll talk about, um, allow for you to have a distributed system. Um, so in this case, your scheduling process and the actual stuff doing the work needs to have some uh, middle, com middle way to communicate, especially if those workers are on different servers. Um, so then you need to set up a messaging queue for the actual distribution if you decide to do that. So it's a little more heavyweight. So after we thought about all this stuff, we had more opinions, um, and we decided that we liked the sophistication of the abstract orchestration systems. We liked the batteries included stuff, all the stuff that came in the box. Um, but we did also like the Drake and Make and Luigi-esque file targeting, especially for our data transformation steps that we were really working on. And it makes it easy to see transparently what's going on, to do this file caching, and also to do data bug tracking. You can easily see, we, I went from this to that, everything's cached, and it's really easy to take a look. And we termed these um, intermediate artifacts is sort of our thought process of what these are, this, this cache that we're building up. We, aka me, aka DevOps, didn't want to maintain a separate scheduling service. I kind of wanted this all to be kind of more together. Um, and so that was another big reason that I liked um, the uh, abstract orchestration systems. Um, we like a really strong community and good documentation. I mentioned before we wanted to be able to extend. Um, this was something that made us, uh, of the three that I mentioned that are abstract um, orchestration systems, Pinball wasn't really like the competitor in this kind of space. They didn't have a ton of great um, documentation, at least at the point that we were taking a look at it. So um, we didn't feel like it was going to be really easy to plug into the community. Um, and we also didn't want to be stuck in one ecosystem. If you choose AWS data pipeline, it's like super AWS times. Um, if you're already in a system that's using a lot of AWS resources and all of your data is there and moving around in AWS, that makes a ton of sense. Um, but for us, it wasn't really the case and we um, wanted to be able to support a lot of uh, different stuff. So we weren't super hyped about that either. So we decided to go with Airflow, and we also decided to pull in this file caching system from the Drake Luigi Times um, into our maybe semi-rudely named uh, personal library called Smart Airflow, and we thought that this was awesome. So here's a little more details about Airflow and the, and the features that they support. So they have a scheduler process uh, that handles the actual triggering and executing of the work. You specify the works in these files called DAGs, short for Directed Acyclic Graph. Some of the other, other, um, the other systems had more fancy names. They just went with DAG. It is what it is. Um, and they can, uh, tr the scheduler can trigger these DAGs on a given schedule. There's a lot of built-in alerting based on SLAs or the task states. So if your task has a failed state or a success state or if it has a retry state or a skipped state, there's a whole pantheon of different types of states they could have that you could specify different types of callbacks for. Um, and there's lots of sexy profiling visualizations. So uh, they, really, um, they really got it with the UI. Uh, the way to make it easy for you to track what's going on, see your task history. Um, they also put in a lot of other stuff to the UI, like different levels of authentication, being able to tune permissions. So you as the DevOps person might take a look at it, but also all your analysts can take a look at it and you can control like what they might want to be able to um, be in charge of. 
Um, there is a really convenient CLI that, among being able to do many of the things that the, U, that the web UI can do, um, it also has these particular helpful things, test, backfill, and clear, which I'll talk about some of these a little bit later too, but the CLI, CLI was just really built out. Um, the operators come, which is a type of task, come from a number of pre-built classes. So they have a Python operator, like S3 key sensor, base transfer, these are all different things that you might want to do, and a lot of them already came in. There's lots of stuff to connect with MS SQL, with MySQL, with Postgres. There's stuff to connect with Hive, to start a Spark job, to start a Hadoop job, all sorts of different stuff that was already built in, uh, submitted by the Airflow core committers or the community. So that was really exciting too. And you can obviously extend any of them using inheritance. Um, and we liked that it can support local work execution, but also distributed work execution. So it's a scalable system. So if you want to use distributed, it uses the Python library Celery to um, communicate with a message queue. Uh, there's several that Celery um, support. RabbitMQ and Redis are really popular ones, but um, this was a, a scalable thing. We knew we could use this later as our tasks went way past 100 or 500 when we needed lots of servers or lots of different types of servers, for example. So this is how the actual um, architecture kind of works for Airflow. So Airflow itself, the services that Airflow ships is the web server and then another concept that's called the executor. The executor contains both the scheduler and the worker processes. Uh, there's different types of executors. There's ones where both of these are done by the same process. There's ones where uh, one of these is the parent process and can spawn other smaller processes, child processes. Or there's the case where you have the scheduler in a totally separate process and the workers are all um, on a different server in a totally different process, not in the same uh, space at all. And then in that case, you need to use some sort of queue to facilitate communication between them. And both the web server and whichever executor you're, you choose also needs to have some metadata database uh, to keep state, since we're no longer keeping state in uh, on disk on the file, in the file system, I mean. Um, so this is just the general architecture of how your Airflow setup will go. So here's some pretty pictures of this nice UI that they spent nice time building. Um, so this gives you an idea of how you can interact with this or how uh, different people in your organization can interact with your Airflow instance to uh, schedule work or stop scheduling work or whatever, ha what have you. Um, so you can have different DAGs here. You can notice what their scheduler schedule is for. You can turn them on and off. You can check what uh, the recent status is, stuff that has succeeded, stuff that has failed, um, stuff that um, is still running. And you have hotkeys to a bunch of other different types of views into this data, um, some of which I'm going to show you. In fact, this is one of them, uh, the graph view. So this is a way to take a look at a given DAG and visualize what all the nodes and edges of the different types of tasks and dependencies are. So you can look at this on a per day um, in the abstract and also per day or per hour, whatever your schedule is. Um, so you can take a look, see a lot of the same stuff in terms of different task stati, but uh, see it in this type of view instead. And there's a bunch of other tabs of different ways to look at things, and I especially really like it. I'm going to show you the Gantt chart and the tree view. Oops. So this is the tree view that uh, they create. So since we have a concept of a schedule, schedule, we have a concept of a scheduler who's going to do stuff over and over, we have historical data about tasks that have happened in the past. So this is one visualization tool that they have uh, to take a look at all your different tasks in the past. And you can also take a look at uh, their status, uh, change the base state so you can look further in the past or however you like, um, and also trigger things from here if you need to. And the Gantt tool, this is one of just many monitoring tools that UIs that I found really useful to uh, be able to diagnose issues with uh, my different DAGs. Um, this is like your standard Gantt chart. You can see different tasks and when they ran and how long it took them and how they overlapped with anything else. And so this can give you a view like maybe something weird is going on here or maybe there's a good reason that it took this long. And there's a lot of other visualizations. You can actually roll your own visualizations too and add your own views onto this if there's some sort of specific situation you want to take a look at uh, for a specific DAG. And then you can um, track that information. And you can always query the metadata database. There's actually a tool built into this UI to do it from here or whatever it is. You can connect directly and take a look at all of this historical data and do whatever profiling that you need. So let's talk about DAGs and tasks. So this is the abstract 
concept here, um, Airflow's implementation of this graph concept of dependencies. I mentioned that a DAG is a collection of things that have some sort of connection to each other, and those things are tasks. In uh, Airflow, there's sort of two different types of tasks. There's sensors, which are kind of like event bindings. They're polling, waiting for some sort of situation to be true. So this is a case like a S3 key sensor, waiting for a key to show up in S3 bucket, or there's a bunch of other ones. Um, and then operators, uh, once uh, they are cleared to start working because their, their um, task dependencies have been met, then uh, they just execute whatever work that they need to do. Maybe they need to run a SQL script, or maybe they need to run some Python script, or any sort of type of thing. And DAGs and tasks have different types of properties you can use to configure them. So you can reuse different types of DAS tasks and reuse different types of DAGs if you like. Um, DAGs have a concept of what their schedule interval is, which I'll get into some more details about later. This is how often it needs to be scheduled. Tasks have um, a bunch of uh, properties that might be shared between different kinds, like who owns them, how many retries they should try for. Maybe you don't want it to retry at all. Maybe you want it to retry 10 times. I don't know. You can do that at the task level, so they're all very specifically configurable. Um, you can give each task its own failure callback if there's some special case that you want to happen. If task B fails, but you want some other thing to happen, if task C fails, then you can do stuff like that. And then they, there's tons of other ones. Um, this is certainly not a complete list. So this is an idea uh, of the um, configuration. I showed you a little bit before really quickly, um, but you can specify a DAG. Here's the DAG definition that takes its parameters. Um, and then different tasks that can be of different operator or sensor types. And then down here on line 44, this is where we're actually specifying the um, connections between them. So I'm setting the T2 task the T1 task upstream of the T2 task. And so this is just your basic DAG configuration, how you actually would specify this in code. So since we have this concept of time, which I keep al alluding to, um, let's talk about DAG runs and task instances. So DAGs and tasks are an abstract concept, but DAG runs actually are DAGs at a certain time. They're DAGs that represent some period of time. And task instances are the tasks that belong to that DAG run. So they inherit inherit the concept of time from their DAG run. Um, and you can really see this in this tree view. Each of these columns and these circles represent some type of DAG run that happened for some certain time. And all of these little boxes are all the task instances that were part of that DAG run that were scheduled for the same time that that DAG run was active. So a little bit more about the architecture and how this actually works. The the uh, connection between the executor, the web server, your metadata database, and whatever your queue is if you decide to use a queue, and then the actual DAG definition files, those Python files that specify the graph dependencies, those exist on file somewhere that you would deploy with your Airflow service. So it starts out where the scheduler pulls the uh, DAGs that are on disk and the metadata database to figure out what it wants to do. So it can see from the DAGs what it's supposed to do. It can see from the metadata database what's already happened. And so it can make some decision about what it's time to do right now. So once it figures out and starts freaking out that it's time to do the thing, it will, especially if like at Industry Dive, you're using a messaging queue to um, distribute the uh, information from the scheduler to the worker, it's going to submit that message to the queue that says do the thing. And then the scheduler is also going to notify the metadata database that it told the queue what was going on. And inside the metadata database, we'll have an entry for a DAG run that knows that it's running, and an entry for a task instance associated with that DAG run that knows that it's queued, that it's waiting to work. So okay, also, the worker is going to be pulling into this queue to figure out what it's supposed to do. And once it sees that there's a message in the queue, it's going to get all excited and decide to do that. And uh, it's going to communicate to both the queue and the metadata database, OK, I got the message. I'm on it. So the queue now knows that this message is being worked on. And the metadata database also knows that this task instance is being worked on. Yes? So how do you know um, from the queue that um, how long it will last for the Yeah, so the, the, the DAG configuration specifies that. The scheduler is in charge of killing anything that it needs to kill. Um, so that's an interesting question. Um, there's different ways that you can specify what your timeouts are. Um, you could 
not have one, I guess, if you really wanted to. Um, another popular thing is to use SLAs, which alert don't actually kill the process, but alert you in some other way that something has gone wrong. I expected this to take less than two hours, but it's been two hours and one second, and I don't know what's happening. And then you can take an intervention action. So um, if you had like a really weird case where you didn't know what was going on, you could use that instead. <laughs> okay, so the worker has communicated to everybody that um, something's being done. So eventually the worker will act back to the queue that it has succeeded and also uh, tell the metadata database that it has succeeded on this task instance that it worked on. So now the metadata database um, knows that the task instance is done. So the queue, this is sort of like ephemeral messaging storage here. So eventually the queue is like, okay, I did my job, buy data. Um, but the good thing is that we have this metadata database over here that still knows all of this history, still knows what has been completed. And because of this, the scheduler can, again, keep doing this process, ask, check the DAG files, check the metadata database, figure out what's going on. And perhaps in this case, our DAG only specifies this one task instance. So if this task is done, the whole DAG is done. So the scheduler can update the metadata database at that point and decide that, okay, we're done with that one and update this um, metadata world uh, for everybody. And since we've got this web server and the people love UIs, he's got to put some data on it. So um, since we have this persistent store over here with all of this data about what's been going on, the web server can now show that to everybody. So that's the basic idea of how everything is communicating here. So alerting is fun. This is something that we like. So we talked just a little bit about SLAs. You can use these to set up sort of a maximum boundary before you think something weird is going on. And then you can take a human intervention. Um, you can specify different callbacks, uh, or you can also uh, already built in is email on retry, failure, success, or any other types of things. So if you're cool with the uh, official like Airflow template for how emails uh, get sent to you on these different types of things, maybe you don't need any sort of special callback. Um, you can specify whatever different timeouts uh, that you need uh, based on what, how long you expect stuff to work. And there's also other ways to connect with other services that you might use for alerting. So there already is in Airflow Core a Slack operator. So if you use Slack at your work, you can easily communicate with that. Um, but you could do this to make one for like PagerDuty or HipChat or whatever it is that you use. Um, configuration abounds. So um, we have a concept of pools, um, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and queues, which is a way to manage your workers, manage your resources, so that um, you don't necessarily want all 100 possible tasks that could be allowed right now to hit your database at the same time. But if you have a bunch of other stuff that can run in parallel without too much confusion, you might let them use a bigger pool or a bigger queue. And I mentioned you can turn your DAGs on and off, and you can also specify different levels of retries at the task level, so that's really nice as well. And um, there's lots of flexibility. We have tons of different types of operators um, that are already built in, and the other great thing is that you can extend your own, which leads me a little bit to what we decided to do, which was to add in this concept of smart airflow, which borrowed this file dependencies concept that we liked from the other, um, other tools and brought it into airflow. So Airflow itself doesn't support much data transfer, only small pieces of data via this uh, thing called XCOM, but it's like a string or an integer. It's not like your whole whatever you were working on. So we added this plugin to Airflow that supports local file system or S3-backed intermediate artifact storage. And it basically leverages Airflow concepts to make that file location predictable so that if you do have this uh, dependency, you have an edge between two tasks, it can easily go figure out where its upstream task data is automatically by using this plugin. So this is just some docs about it, but the important thing is it knows how to get the input file name and get the output file name for itself, and it knows how to predict all of that, and then so you don't have to deal with figuring out where those files are yourself or configure it during the DAG. So this uh, led us to an ETL paradigm where we wanted to make each task as small as possible while maintaining readability, because this could get out of hand, I'm sure you could imagine. So. Uh, still maintaining readability, and we would preserve the output for each task in a file-based intermediate artifact. So we wanted it in a format that was consumable by its dependent task. So this is the whole file cache. And we wanted to avoid finalizing our artifacts for as long as possible. We're doing this data warehousing thing. Eventually we have to do the L and ETL, but we're waiting until uh, we've completed all of these smaller tasks so we can confirm that all of the work was done that we, the way we wanted to. We could go back to the cache if we needed to, and then we finalize whatever it is as the last step. And the simplest step in the DAG is storage. So if I've sold you on Airflow, uh, you don't actually have to throw any money at it because it is free and open source. 
And um, you can actually, it's on PyPI, so you can pip install Airflow to get started really quick. And um, they've made it really easy to get started in like 30 seconds, right? There's like a built-in conf.py that already knows some sensible defaults. It will spin up a SQLite metadata database that already came with your Python distribution. And there's a ton of example DAGs, so you can just get it started. Um, if you want to uh, move up to something a little more productionized, uh, for us, uh, a GitHub user named Puckle created a Docker Airflow um, repository that has Docker files and Docker Compose files about setting this up more production level scale. So we've extended from theirs for our specific use case, but I really recommend that. And um, also in the repository uh, at Apache Incubator Airflow, there are um, some upstart and some systemd templates that uh, the community has contributed as well if you don't want to use Docker. So some things, some tips, tricks, and gotchas for Airflow that I have learned. Um, minimize your dev environment with the uh, easier executors. You don't necessarily need to use your Celery executor right out of the box. Uh, so you can separate your logic problems from your system problems. And there's a CLI called Airflow Test that also makes it really easy to just run things in the foreground uh, without interacting with the metadata database if you just need to do a quick test. Um, when you do get to the point where you, you want to test your DAG with the scheduler, there's this handy dandy at once schedule interval. So the scheduler will just pick up knowing that it's time to run something immediately. You don't have to put it on some schedule and then like wait five minutes or 10 minutes or anything like that. Um, you can just use this at once and it will just immediately try and start to execute. Um, my tip, don't bother with the nascent plugin system. Airflow does have a plugin system, but it, it's on the roadmap to uh, improve it, but it's most people just ship their custom operators with their DAGs through whatever deployment process they have. They don't try and like build an Airflow pu plugin separately. And another thing that kind of surprises some people, or surprised us for sure, there's no built-in log rotation and it, the Airflow service automatically like stores all its log files to disk in this kind of complicated location. Um, and the default logging is really verbose and then if you add in your own, it starts to get really large. So as of Airflow 1.7, there's a really simple thing in conf.py you can configure for it to actually just send all those logs to S3 and then you can just set up whatever you want to just clear out all of the local logs as you see fit. For us, we have about 1,300 tasks across eight active DAGs and 27 worker processes that are all sitting on the same M4 extra large AWS EC2 instance. So we utilize pools I mentioned a little bit before to manage resources. So we have like a lot of storage tasks, but we don't want them all like trying to communicate to the database at once. So we create a pool that only has one or two workers, subscribe to it, and then uh, that's where all of our database tasks go. You should consider using queues if you have really different types of work to do. So if you need like an R server and you need a Go server and a Scala server or whatever, um, you can set up a distributed system and then use the queues um, instead to have workers only subscribe to certain types of queues and have the scheduler only submit certain types of work to those queues. And we're using retries here, so if it wasn't clear, your tasks need to be idempotent if you are going to be using that um, so that they can, you don't get surprised if they run again. So the last thing, the biggest gotcha that happens for users for Airflow is this time concept, like when is stuff happening and when is my schedule going? So here's a line that is time. Um, and you can, and we as humans do split up time into arbitrary intervals. And for example, it might be every 24 hours. And in the Airflow speak, this is a schedule interval. The schedule intervals are represented by their execution date, which is at the top of the schedule interval. So this entire period of time here is represented by this execution date that's at the top of the interval. So here's like the Guitar Hero period. So data is like streaming in and time, time is moving on and sometimes we cross these arbitrary boundaries and we get more data, blah, blah, blah. So if we're at the situation where now is here, we can't actually do the work for the execution date for the schedule interval that the top of it is represented by 2016-1001 until this allowable time. So once we get to execution date plus schedule interval, it's now allowable. So all of the data has already, by the time we get to here, all the data that represents 2016-1001 has already happened, right? All the data that could possibly come for that date is done. So the actual time that the DAG run gets instantiated is after this allowable date, this um, DAG run gets associated with this execution date, but it has a concept called start date, which is when it actually started, right? The actual time that the run happened is different from the data that it's representing. And this like blows people's minds, right? Because it, 
it doesn't necessarily make sense. And also these words are maybe not the best words to represent them uh, in everybody's everyday usage. So execution date does not equal start date. Um, and it's the same for task instances too, since they inherit their configuration from the DAG runs. You can kind of see here, but this run was scheduled for 2016-1008 at 4 UTC, but it didn't actually start until 2016-1007 at 4 and 23 seconds UTC. And the, possibly the most confusing thing ever is that execution date does not equal start date, but sometimes start date doesn't equal start date because in the DAG model, there's another keyword argument called start date that is unrelated completely to this concept of execution date and start date that is relevant for DAG runs and task instances. So this is also in the roadmap to, com to clear up this confusion, but a lot of people get confused about this issue. So um, I just wanted to point out that there's another term. There's another column in the metadata database somewhere else called start date that doesn't mean the same thing. If you still don't get it and are very confused, um, I definitely recommend, got to make a time travel joke, time travel yourself. If we're in the future right now and you're watching this online, rewind. And if uh, we're in the future, either now uh, these people here in real time or the people on video, ask me. I'm pretty friendly. I gave you all my internet communication ways, uh, so feel free to ask me. And actually, this conversation has been going on with Airflow on the Google Groups, on the Gitter, in the Airflow docs, on the dev list, on the dev list mailing archives. There's a lot to look at. And I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek here. I kind of want to point that out because they have a really great community and a lot of people who are, are trying to use this and trying to figure it out. So um, there's a lot of great information there. In fact, um, they're, as I, as I kind of alluded to but didn't explicitly mention, they are an incubating project for Apache. Uh, so there will one day be Apache Airflow. They originally came from Airbnb, and they're hardening their first Apache release right now, actually. So if you wanted to get in the thick of things right now, before it's cool, now's the time. So that's it. Um, I did want to say, P.S., there's an appendix. In the longer version of this talk, I included way more details about all those other pipelining things that I didn't talk about. So if you uh, get these slides online, I've submitted them to wherever in the ether to Pi data that someday they will show up somewhere, um, then you can keep scrolling through if you want to get some more details about those. But otherwise, that's it for this, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes? Yes. Uh, and some people, uh, so DAGs are, can, are Python files, and so you can import them around. Um, you can create DAGs dynamically. You could have some sort of for loop that iterates over some type of condition that your DAG is testing for to decide if it needs to make more DAGs. Uh, we use that at the task level. So inside a DAG, uh, we query for um, this like list of different types of data that we want to work on, and then we dynamically instantiate all of our tasks. So you can do stuff like that. So the way that that interacts with the scheduler, the scheduler is pulling the files every five seconds, or you can configure that, you can make it different, is pulling the files every five seconds. So if you have some sort of like dynamic situation that is changing externally, then the scheduler can keep picking it up. It's going to keep pulling those files. It doesn't like hold them in memory. So if some external situation changes, then it, the scheduler will pick that up and then decide to do that work. The DAG configuration is file based. So, um, so the scheduler knows what work should be done in what order based on these files, and then it pulls it. It builds its own sort of idea of the graph and compares it to the metadata database and then sends those messages to the workers or the worker queue. And then the worker just picks them up. So the scheduler is in charge of figuring out what needs to happen based on whatever this template is of what is supposed to happen and what it already knew did happen. Does that make sense? OK. Yes? So you mentioned that you had a requirement that this be Python-based because yeah. you work with Python, and I, I wholly endorse that. And we're also at PyData, so it's a similar Right. Uh, are there any? Um, editors or alternatives that are outside of the Python space that are worth considering as well? 
Um, that's a good question and one I'm not really prepared to answer because I had that requirement from the beginning. Um, I do know that there are some uh, like commercial products too. Um, I guess AWS Data Pipeline is kind of a commercial product, but um, a lot of people compare this to Uzi and Azkaban or Act. I don't, I don't actually know what they're called because uh, I haven't used them, but some people use those tools as well. It's actually in the Airflow docs. They're like, we're comparable to blah, 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 but like we're Python open source free, blah, blah, blah. So I can't really answer your question in other terms, but that's some other stuff that I've seen. Uh, sure. The question was about what I've had to overcome with Airflow. So definitely the short list was kind of all those things I mentioned. The start date drama was the biggest drama of them all, I would say. Um, and as you mentioned, the Airflow, we've been using it for the past year. We started on 1.6, now they're on 1.7. Um, and there was a bunch of sort of weird stuff going on then. Like they had a problem where a couple bugs where the scheduler, you had to like bounce it every once in a while um, because it would like randomly hang, uh, which has been resolved and we have never actually observed since um, we've moved up to 1.7, but uh, stuff like that, uh, that was kind of surprising. Um, but other than that, I think basically that list, I feel is all that we've really experienced. So if you want to talk about whatever your thing was, we can talk about it sometime. Yeah, no problem. Yes. Sure. So if your job require, requires rollback in case that, that you fail. So that is uh, the purview of the task to define. So um, if it would need to define however it needs to roll back, um, you could include that, for example, in a, on failure callback for that task. If it does some sort of, if it throws some sort of weird exception, you could have it roll back um, based on whatever logic you define in its callback. Um, or um, it, it sort of depends what you're doing. If you're doing some sort of data, database stuff, you could wrap the whole thing in a transaction. If it throws an exception, then the whole the database is going to roll back, roll it back for you. Um, so that it's mostly in the purview of the logic that you write. So is the answer. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anything else? All right. Well, you can definitely contact me on the internet anyway, and I'll be hanging around PyData for the rest of the time. So thank you very much.